Yo, family, what's going on? What's going down? What's shaking? Welcome to Jonathan Souls Podcast. This is Jonathan Soul speak with you now. Here on Jonathan Soul Sundays, every Sunday, every Sunday, I talk to an artist, a writer, a filmmaker, an expat, an entrepreneur, somebody who's creating the kind of world that they want to live in. So if you have any interest in these fields, any curiosity, any desire to create your own path, this is the show that you need to tune into. At the end of the interview, you'll hear their contact information where you can reach out to them, purchase services, uh, get their books, their novels, their art, whatever it is. And of course, go to JonathanSoul.com and pick up my novel, Malcolm Mars, the sci-fi novel I wrote, and you can support this broadcast. All right, family, without further ado, let's get into the program. Jonathan Soul Sundays. I got the honor and privilege of talking to a brother who will scare you to death if you let him. I'm talking about the horror and the thriller writer, Brandon Massey. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good. How are you? Real good, man. Real good, real good. Now, uh, let me ask you a question, man. I, I, I peeped the bio a little bit, and I want to know, did you leave Chicago because of Trump? You can be honest, <laughs> man. I know the troops was coming. I heard, I heard boots on the ground. I just want to know, was that the reason that what happened? <laughs> No, actually, I left Chicago about 16 years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, w- I was living in the suburbs, so, you know, I wasn't, you know, deep deep in the heart of the city. Uh-huh. You wasn't on Ground Zero. No, no, I wasn't on, I wasn't on Ground Zero. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if I were still there, you know, it, it, let's just say there's it, just a lot going on there right now. You know, yeah, I uh, mean, I know that there's like, what is it, like 20-some you know, districts or, or whatever in that area. So I know it's not every area is, you know, impoverished and, and not every area is dangerous. You know, right. um, I, I personally think that the whole area is getting a bad rap. I mean, I think Trump is just using it as a, uh, a whipping boy, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's it's an easy target for him right now. And, uh, you know, I, I don't really know what, if anything, he's actually going to do about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just I think that the issues that are going on in Chicago, um, just like other issues going on in other major cities, you know, are there are things that just can't be so easily solved. I mean, they're very complex problems that have been generations in the making. I mean, this stuff didn't just start just didn't just start overnight, you know. Right. Um, so there's a lot of you know, areas that need to be addressed from a, you know, an economic perspective, mm-hmm. um, educational perspective, you know, the school systems are not where they need to be. Um, you know, there's just a whole gamut of, uh, problems. Mm-hmm. He, I, I personally don't think he's very serious about solving those issues, but it, it's a way for him to look to his supporters like he's taking charge, you know mm-hmm. what I mean. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I personally think that the election for Trump was his own thriller novel. He was turning the page, <laughs> you know what I mean. And he was going through little things and stuff. And I don't think he really thought he was going to win. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think he you know, he was running on a campaign. You know, was he just really trying to touch hot button topics for his supporters? But right. I think he was as shocked as any as we all were. Uh huh. Um, you know, I, I literally when I wo- I stayed up late that night watching the results coming in, and I was, you know, once you started seeing him taking these some of these battleground states, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan, mm-hmm. Wisconsin, I was like, oh my god, this really this is really gonna happen. I don't believe this. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then when it all went down. And Trump came out of the office. First of all, he stayed in there with Obama in the in the in the little conference room for like right. a damn near two hours. Right. And when he came out, that dude had a look on his face like, "What did I get into?" Oh my god! <laughs> I <laughs> done fucked Sorry. up now. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it was interesting. I was reading um, an interview with Howard Stern. You know, he had done a lot of interviews with Trump over the years, uh-huh. and his theory was that. The only reason Trump ran for president is he wanted a big, a bigger contract from NBC for The Apprentice. Wow. It was so it was just a PR campaign basically. 
Mm-hmm. He just happened to catch this wave of uh, uh, discontent with Washington, and these folks actually voted him president. I mean, it's still surreal. Yeah, this very guy- surreal. Very surreal. Wow. And uh, speaking of surreal, um, so you write horror novels. You write thrillers. And as a matter of fact, I saw upwards of what? Like ten books over the years since what two thousand was it two thousand two? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, I had self published my very first one, uh-huh. and that was Thunderbirds, the- right? Yeah, Thunderland. Yeah, Thunderland. Okay, I'm sorry, Thunderland. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, there's been you know about ten novels, um, some story collections, some anthologies. So just you know, uh, just trying to stay busy. You know, I have lots of Lots of ideas for stuff I haven't even gotten to even writing yet mm-hmm. because, you know, ideas, they're everywhere. I mean, I can walk down the street and come up with an idea. I mean, there's just that's just kind of how my mind works. Mm-hmm. Uh, although just kind of to go back to Trump, I mean, I don't think anyone could have written something like that. You know, that, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying, <laughs> man. I, I really I'm not saying we're living in some kind of virtual reality thing, but. I think we're living in a moment in history where, right. you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 years from now, people are going to be like, what? Are, you, are y'all serious? <laughs> exactly. Are y'all serious? And the funny thing about it is we're all on this ride together. I mean, if there's a such thing as an Illuminati, they haven't talked to Trump yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's still, he's still like, oh, shit. Well, I guess I got to make the best of it, you know, kind yeah, of a thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This, this is crazy. I mean, the other thing is, you know, with the social media piece, this mm-hmm. guy, Trump, Trump, he, he tweets more than my daughter. Yeah. He, treat, he tweets more. Than, and whoever thought there's something as silly as a tweet. I mean, it just sounds silly. I still don't like the name, is it? <laughs> but we find it now what's going on with the federal government. On social yeah. blanket media. Can you believe that? No, I keep waiting for somebody to just take his phone. That's something that Bradbury <laughs> never seen coming. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like I was just talking to uh to Guy Sims, who was a writer. He started with like the Brother Man comic back in the day. Now he's doing detective novels. I mm-hmm. I, I want to ask you the same question I asked him. Do you think that social media is dumbing down the English language? Absolutely. Because yeah. if it's dumbing down the language, isn't it dumbing down the, the thought processes? I mean, talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I think it is. I mean, and I see just not even just from a Twitter perspective, but just think about text messaging. Okay. Um, and I'm guilty of this myself, even though I've written books where I will shorten words and not use complete sentences, not use correct punctuation, Mm -hmm. just because I'm trying to quickly get a message across via text to, you know, my wife, my mother, whoever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you see everyone's doing this, we're not taking the time to form complete sentences, use proper punctuation, follow all those rules of of, uh, grammar and usage that we learned in school. Um, you know, it, it generally, I think it does change the quality of of our thoughts and our in our discourse. If you think about it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if we're getting news from Twitter and, you know, 140 characters, how much depth are you really absorbing from a tweet? Right. You know, or you look on Facebook, which and I know you've seen this and we've heard about the so-called fake news, the battle against fake news. Mm-hmm. How do you really know what's real and what isn't? I mean, you see stuff people post all the time that just flat out isn't true. Like they'll say, oh, you know, Eddie Murphy died last night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's like, oh, he didn't. It's a hoax. Right. But as soon as that gets posted, people will immediately start commenting on it like it's true. Right. Oh, and, you know, he was such a talent. So sad. Um and I just think that it's this we're in this age now of, uh, you know, like instant commentary. No one's we're not taking the time often enough to just stop and think, does this really make sense? Hmm. Um, you know, we're such in a such the, a rush to just, you know, like somebody's post or comment on somebody's post about this or that. 
And I just don't feel like as a as a society, we are taking a step back, taking the time to think through this communication that we're having. And one of the things I actually did recently, because I felt like I was falling into that same trap, because I actually subscribed to a couple of newspapers, the print versions of the newspapers, mm-hmm. so that I would get away from my computer, get away from my cell phone, and actually have to read through an old school newspaper, you know. Um, you you read which, you read paper. Yeah, paper. <laughs> and, and you, it, it, they're talking about made from trees, right? You, you read that kind yeah, of thing. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's amazing, yeah, man. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I just found that I need a break from looking at a computer screen, looking at a cell phone yeah. all day long, and uh, I just think more of us need to just take time away i mean i know are you you're in new york right uh dc dc maryland DC. area yeah yeah so yeah so you'll get this so you know here in atlanta traffic obviously is a major issue i know it's an issue in the dc area too mm-hmm. just think about whenever you go out driving how many people you see on their cell phone when they're supposed to be driving yeah yeah and it's literally become tragic because you see so many Accidents cause. I mean, I've been in near accidents uh, because somebody was texting or otherwise occupied on their phone as they're drifting over the lane about to smash into me. Right. You know? So we've just become this nation of people who just literally aren't paying attention to what's going on around us. Mm-hmm. We're just mm-hmm. fixated, you know, on these screens and Twitter, Facebook, you know, all these different um you know websites and you know you, you go to a website like uh you know like a, the Washington Post or the New York Times you know the the comment section is more important more interesting than the actual article now Just- now let's go into that a little bit cuz I was going to mention that earlier people a lot of times they look at the headline and then they go straight to the comment section what is right. what does that say about our society what does that say yeah, I just, we don't really care about whatever the writer was saying we just want to hear what people are thinking hmm um, you know, I'm guilty of that too, where I'll kind of quick, quickly skim the article and then I just want to get down to, okay, let's expand the comments. Let's see what folks are saying about this. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, naturally you get the trolls on there, especially now with all the political stuff going on. So what is that? I guess what I'm trying to get at, what does that say in terms of what we value? Is it a voyeuristic kind of a thing? Is it, we don't trust a quote unquote authority. What, what does that mean that we, we go straight to the comments? I think some of it is, I think some of it's voyeuristic for those of us who are more lurkers. We're not necessarily commenting on the story. We just want to see what other people are saying. Mm-hmm. Not one of those people. I, you know, I'm not trying to get in an argument with somebody on a website about some story. Right. So I'm just more of a, you know, sort of like a, um, a rubbernecker passing by a traffic accident, you gotcha. know, okay. right? <laughs> I'm just saying, what, what are they saying? What's going on here? Um, but the other people, I think um, the, uh, not, the anonymity of the Internet mm-hmm. allows you to get it gives you what they call that keyboard courage. Yeah. Where you feel yeah. like I can get into an argument. I can be as rude as I want to be. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to bear any consequences of that. Yeah. And some, oh, there are some folks out there who they enjoy that. You know, they just want to wade in and shout folks down and cuss at them and all this stuff. And it's, it's, it just kind of gives a vehicle to some of the some of the less socially acceptable parts of us. Yeah. You know, um, mm-hmm. because a lot of the things that you see these people say on these message boards or comment sections, they would you know, they would never say to somebody's face in a room. Exactly. Ever. So, yeah, I mean, on one hand, it's great that people are being honest, um, uh, you know, honest with, you know, with whatever their opinion is. They're being honest about that. Um, But other times I think it's just created this this environment where we can't even have a civil conversation about anything, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think this keyboard courage, as you call it, is like the liquid courage back in the day. Yeah. Like, you know, what yeah. I mean, when people wouldn't say shit until they was they were sloppy drunk and then all of the feelings come out. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess you know, to wrap this whole social media thing up, to to me, you know, this liquid courage, keyboard courage, whatever you want to call it, is showing that society is evolving very slowly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like it's very slowly. Now I make a, a clear distinction, you know, it, it, whenever possible between, you know, my white brothers and sisters uh -huh. who are racist pieces of shit. Yeah. And then the progressive, the quote unquote progressive people mm -hmm. who, you know, like to me, the difference between a liberal and a, and a conservative is, the liberals don't beat their slaves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, that's, that's the difference. I mean, none of them want to disarm the police. You know what I mean? None of them, none yeah. of them want to, you know, you know, make any serious changes. None of them want to talk about ownership. None of that kind of stuff. Um, and so it kind of it kind of shows us where we are. But on the flip side, the most beautiful thing about social media, and, and it's, it's part of the reasons why I love doing this show, is that, that it gives artists... And not everybody does it, but it gives artists the opportunity to get rid of the middleman and take their product right directly to, uh, you know, to the consumer. I was peeping at your uh, Facebook page a little bit, and I saw how many people were saying, you know, love your novel, can't wait for the next one to come out. You know, this one guy, uh, I think it's a guy, no, it's a, it's a girl. Um, I don't read too many books twice, but I've read two of your books twice. Yeah. Longtime fan of what I consider. Uh, a Georgia author. So, I mean, how important is that to you in terms of your writing and, and you gauging what impact your writing is having on your audience? Oh, it's huge. Um, you know, when I first started out, you know, the internet was in terms of being a marketing vehicle was really just, just getting started. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, you I gave did... your age away when you said message board. I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, brother, way too far apart. I got you. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was just just getting started, a bit, you know. But now, um, you know, because I was with a, a major New York publisher for several years. Okay. And, um, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages disadvantages to that. But you know, my last couple books I've released independently, and I plan to continue to do that. Really? Because, yeah, absolutely, because. I have complete control over when the book comes out, mm -hmm. the final content of the book, the cover design, where it's promoted, how it's distributed, you know, all of those different uh, decisions I'm able to make. And then you tie in the, the social media aspects of being able to get the message out um, exactly how I want it to be conveyed mm -hmm. you know, is very important. And uh, it's a very important uh asset uh, as a as a writer to have mm -hmm. um you know and you know and i try to strike a balance um on facebook and uh, the other social media platforms with i don't want to be one of those people that just constantly is promoting myself yeah you know because i, I have some uh probably a few thousand facebook friends where you know some of them are writers and it just seems like okay well i don't even know you but you're already promoting your book wow so think that we, we you know we have to strike a balance between engaging people um you know, in conversation but also balancing that with you know just not trying to be some hustler all the time getting your work out there so mm -hmm. um but i just think overall um you know for writers for for recording artists for filmmakers you know the the changes with how intellectual property is distributed in the last few years have been just literally world changing. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you can now have a legitimately successful career without dealing with a major publishing or recording company. I mean, look at uh, chance the rapper in Chicago mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where he wins a Grammy. I mean, he was an independent artist. Wow. You know, so, um, this, these are things that just weren't possible 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, authors, creators of all kinds have that power. Oh, just even look at the show you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, could you have had this 15 years ago? Probably not. You right, know, right, but, right. But now you've got this opportunity where you just decided, you just decided, you know what? 
this is the kind of show I want to hear. So instead of waiting on somebody to do it, I'm going to create it myself. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just incredibly empowering. And, you know, there are people out there. What's what's interesting, too, is when you par- start putting your your work out there, you find that there are others of like mind who say, you know what, this is exactly what I've been wanting to hear, too. Mm-hmm. You just have these, you know, like these pockets of, uh, of, of like minded people just who, you know, you have this interest and support with this, you know, similar thing. So it's just, it's a great, it's a great time to be someone who creates um, anything new um, these days. You know, I, I've been saying this on my, on my show since probably the second episode that there's, we're in the middle of like this uh, renaissance of African American, I would say content creators. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, uh, you know, I think it's something similar to what was happening in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say in the nineties, because there was a ton of people, I was in Philly at the time and there was a ton of people that are, they were doing all kinds of stuff. It was the, the people who were doing the hair and the locks and coming out with their own hair care products. And then it was the, the mm-hmm. comic book people. And it was the writers, everybody's independent publishing, some from Kinko, some more legitimate. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and they were in that and the black expos to travel up and down the East Coast and the whole bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so I'm talking to these people. So I'm talking to a brother from Canada who's doing his own stuff, even with the podcasting thing. I mean, it's a this one show, which is kind of cute. They're kind of young. You know, what I mean, it's like the millennial something like uh, melanin millennials, I think is what they call it. <laughs> Sassy little 20 somethings, you know, just just yeah. just talking whatever they talk, you know, and uh, and like you said, the people it's like their own personal gravity. It's that line from from PM Dawn, my own personal gravity serves me well. Yeah. All those yeah. people are just drawn to them, you know, and um, and uh, I don't want to talk too much, but tell me about your your demographic. It, it, who, who, who responds to you? Who is reaching out to you on social media? Describe those people. I think right now, and as it's been for, I would say the majority of the of my career, it's been primarily black women. I would say um, probably between the ages of twenty five and fifty four. <laughs> Is that a demographic group? Wait um, a minute! Wait a minute! Wait. You mean <laughs> sisters are reading your scary novels, man? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Absolutely. Wow. And, you know, I have done um, dozens and dozens of book club meetings, you know, mm-hmm. over the phone and in person across the country. Um, so I would say I would, if I had to put a percentage, I would say that probably 75 percent is that particular group. Wow. And, um, you know, after that, then I would say um, black men, mm-hmm. you know, not, not, as, not as many black men as I would like. I think a lot of brothers mostly will read. Uh, nonfiction, you know, we're looking for for information, not necessarily looking for a story. Sure, you know, looking for something like you know, tell me how to make some money. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> tell right. me how to deal with the man. You know, it's mm-hmm. just something like that. You know, more more of a immediately applicable type information. But there's still those of us who do, you know, read uh, fiction. Um, so that would be the second largest group, probably ten percent. After that, I would say it really runs the gamut. I mean, it's, you know, white, white women, uh, some white men, um, you know, people of color, you know, not black people, but, you mm-hmm. know, Hispanic, um, Asian, mm-hmm. you know, you know, but those are, the you know, the smaller segments. So mm-hmm. you know, and the thing is, um, when I was a re- when I was published by Kensington out of New York and I was part of a you know, an actual African-American imprint okay. called Dafina. And, um, you know, they specifically focused on the African-American market. So um, at the time, you know, there were a lot of black bookstores across the country, you know, independent stores. Mm-hmm. So that a big focus was getting into those stores, um, getting into the the blacks fiction section of a bookstore chain like Borders, you know, remember them, Borders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, I was there buying my stuff. <laughs> the last day I felt like a vulture, man. I felt real shame myself, man. I had an arm full of stuff. 
You know, when they when they went out of business, that really impacted the bottom lines of a lot of black authors because we were selling 40 percent of our books in borders. Wow. wow. Yeah. I mean, they they did a really good job with getting our books, uh, you know, in front of the readers. They did a really good job with that. Mm-hmm. They, they weren't replaced. You know, Barnes and Noble doesn't do as good of a job um, with that. And, you know, obviously online book selling has really taken off since then so you know it's mm-hmm. pretty much amazon is you know the number one game in town now exactly but um you know as far as the demographic is concerned you know those are pretty much uh you know i haven't done an official study but just from you know anecdotal evidence i would say those are that's the breakdown of it okay uh, you know and i'm that's cool you know i'm i honestly at this point i'm happy to have any fans yeah. any readers <laughs> at all it's cool with me because I've just decided I'm going to write what I enjoy writing, mm-hmm. uh, what I feel like I can write well and what challenges me. That's that's what I'll focus on. And then whoever happens to like these kinds of stories, I'm happy to I'm happy to have them along for the ride. So it's not it's not so much a thing of I'm, I'm trying to say, oh, I only want black women or black men or whatever. I'm just right. trying to write stories that I feel are representative mm-hmm. of the world that. I know. Right. Now you I got know. you. It's like I say, your own personal gravity, man. You ain't got to make yeah. excuses for Mother Nature. Let me let me ask you this question. Let me answer this question. What function does horror, and this is my North Carolina accent coming out. I can't say that last <laughs> OR. What, what function does horror serve in society? It's got to have a function. I think I know, but you're the expert. What does horror serve? What, what function? Why do we go to horror novels why do we read your books why what's what's the other than the excellent writing and all that kind of stuff but what 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 value do we gain from it so i i really think that for horror fiction movies um activities like riding a roller coaster i really think it's because people have this thrill seeker gene well, not really a gene but a thrill seeker uh, inclination where you want to be taken to the edge. Okay. And then you want to come out on the other side and realize that, hey, you know what? That was pretty awful, but I survived that. Okay. You know, it's almost like it, in a way, sort of prepares you to deal with the worst things that could possibly happen. You know, mm-hmm. and it, with my books in particular, obviously, um, you know, they're about things that, horrible things that happen, people die people getting killed in bad ways mm-hmm. but you have the primary characters you know somebody lives mm-hmm. somebody sees these horrible things they endure it they survive they may be scarred by it but they're still get to the other side and they are they've learned something from that experience so i think that we have as human beings we have this um innate inclination to want to know what death feels like you know no one really knows until obviously until you actually die Mm -hmm. but we want to at least get an experience that sort of approximates what we think it would be like Mm -hmm. and then get comforted that okay you know what that was pretty scary but i'm all right you know like you get on that roller coaster you know that goes 15 stories high in the air and swoops down and makes you feel like your stomach's in your mouth but when the ride's over you're like you know what that was scary as hell but i'm all right um so i i really think that that's kind of what it fulfills you see people in the movie theater watching horror horror films jumping in their seat screaming you know and it's it's scary but it's kind of fun in a way and it's thrilling it gets your heart pumping it gets your adrenaline surging you know mm-hmm. and um So when I'm writing, when I'm writing, you know, I'm trying to take people to that peak Mm -hmm. of of terror, but also show them that, you know, when it's all said and done, you know what, this character or these characters may have been through this, but they live through it and they're stronger for it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's ultimately the message that, um, you know, we 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 seek um, from this type of material. Wow. All right, all right. I, I hope I could have said that better. So, uh, speaking of uh, uh, scary stuff, In the Dark, uh, novel that came out in uh, 2013, 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, describe a little bit about that. Um, it seemed like you got a, a Morehouse graduate running for his life. Is that the deal? <laughs> so, so that one is about um, this. You know, my, most of my books are set in the Atlanta area because you know that's where I live, and it's easy to just drive down the street and set my story somewhere. Mm-hmm. But, um, this particular one is about a, a family that um, they get this really good deal on a historic home in a, um, uh, a historic neighborhood of Atlanta. Okay. And so they're moving into the house and, you know, they're excited about it, got this great deal. But then before they've even finished unpacking, somebody shows up at the front door and it's this old man. Um, and he basically tells him, look, I know you got a good deal on this place, but this is actually my house. It was stolen from me mm-hmm. and I want it back. I'm giving you three days to get the hell out of here Ooh. or else. <laughs> okay. And there's some indication when he has this discussion with the husband at the beginning of the story that he may be, there's more to him than meets the eye. You know, mm-hmm. we know he's, he's not just some, um, kooky old man, he may actually have some particular talents um, or a background that makes him somebody to be reckoned with. Okay. So the story follows, um, it, you know, it's all it all takes place within three days. Wow. And basically, from that initial confrontation on the front porch of the house, things just begin to escalate mm-hmm. for the family. And, you know, um, What's always interesting when I write these stories and I have characters who are Mm -hmm. um, African-American, a lot of black folks, when we see a movie, we'll say, you know what, if that if if that happened to a black person, immediately I'm leaving the house. Right. No, if white folks stay, black folks leave. Mm -hmm. So I always when I write these stories, I have to think of like realistic reasons for why a black person would stay in the house. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) once you deal with that of, okay, here is why they might stay in the house. Um, you know, you kind of handle it from there. And then you then you escalate it further and say, well, uh, with this particular story, I actually had them just decide, you know what? We don't want the house anymore. We're getting out. Mm-hmm. He can have it. Well, by then it's too late. It doesn't matter. So, um, you know, that this the story, is, I don't want to spoil anything. Right, no, don't spoil it, don't spoil it. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's exactly, you know, that's how it builds. It's just realistically handling how would you know a black black family handle a situation like that um because we have this idea in our heads that you know what if somebody came up to me and was talking crazy and i thought that there was something supernatural about them i'm just gonna leave right okay well you might leave but what if that doesn't end it Mm -hmm. you know so it just kind of builds from there but yeah that um that was a fun book to write you know it deals with the subject of uh of voodoo, which really, you know, kind of, yeah, it kind of freaked some people out, but you know, it was <laughs> it was it was fun to to deal with. Um, you know, I did a, a good amount of research, mm-hmm. as I always do, to just try to make it you know uh, somewhat credible, at least sound credible anyway. Okay, and uh, yeah, so the the response to that book has has been really good. So let me ask you this: when you write, how are you like? From what perspective are you writing? Are you just like this kind of all-seeing eye above, watching everything below? Or are you inside with the characters? Well, I'm definitely inside with the characters. Um, the book I'm working on now, for example, um, you know, I, I always create a, a basic outline before I start uh, writing something. But what always happens in the course of actually writing it, I start identifying so closely with the characters that I will start changing the story from what I originally planned. Okay. Because I'll realize, well, hey, this guy or this woman is actually not going to do what I thought they would do at first. Mm -hmm. They're the kind of person who is, they're not going to run away. They're going to do, make this decision or that decision that will sort of veer, veer away from what I had originally planned. Um, So, you know, that forces me to sort of recalibrate the story, but it's a great thing because that show that's evidence to me that I'm at least emotionally connecting with the material. So you're saying that the characters are kind of guiding you or yeah, influencing exactly. you? Okay. Yeah, they, they they basically to some extent take on a life of their own. 
Um, so be so, so that being said, is there ever a point in your writing process where you scare the hell out of yourself? Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. I, mean, that, I actually feel like there's every time I write a story, I need to have that particular experience where I need to have a scene uh-huh. where I got chills down my spine when I wrote it because I was so closely um, experiencing that moment with the character. So I definitely... You know, I, I'd like to feel that. I like to feel like if a character is feeling sad, if they're crying, you know, I want to feel tears in my eyes. To me, that's what I'm seeking because I think if I'm experiencing this through the character that I'm writing, then I'm going to be able to touch the reader that much more effectively. So wow. I'm really looking for those strong emotional connections. Tell me a little bit about your writing process. So so what I, I have pretty much have the same process I follow where I will take some time, brainstorm some ideas. And I, you know, I, as I said earlier, I have ideas for, it would probably take me 20 years to write all the ideas I've generated so far. But um, once I get that basic premise, which really just starts with um, asking the question, what if, you know, what if, um, a family bought a house and soon after they got there, some crazy person showed up and told them to get out in three days. Mm-hmm. Uh, so start with that initial question. What if that premise and then really um, start taking notes? This really um, fr- sort of a free association process of just thinking of random scenes, you know, pieces of dialogue, just things that could possibly happen in the course of fleshing out that story. Mm-hmm. From there, that might that process might take a few weeks mm-hmm. for me to work through, and then I will actually start doing a, a more formal outline of here's what I see happening in the beginning of the book, here's what I see happening in the middle, and then here's what I see happening in the end. And then um, that usually will take me about a month to flesh out. Mm-hmm. So I have that. I usually get to a point where I'm just sort of tired of working on the outline and I'll just be impatient to actually start writing a draft. So I'll start writing the first draft. The first draft could take it could take a month. It could take four or five months. It just depends on how quickly it flows. But I'll have that first draft. I really at that point, I'm not trying to get everything perfect. I'm just trying to get down the story as as quickly as possible, like follow whatever inspiration I get, put it down on the, you know, on the page and just keep, keep things rolling. Okay. So I'll finish the first draft. I like to set that aside for at least a couple weeks to just sort of let it marinate a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'll come back, I'll read it from beginning to end, start making notes about, okay, you know, I like that part of the book. I didn't like that part of the book. I need to add in some more details about this or change this character or add a new character, you know, whatever, um, you know, story logic or structural type uh, improvements I need to make. So I'll do a second draft Mm -hmm. with all those notes. And then I'll also finally do a third draft where sort of is like a cleanup draft of just trying to get everything as as, uh, tight as possible with the story. And then normally by that point, I'm done. Um, Okay. Okay. Usually I don't do more than three. But, you know, some people will do, you know, they'll do five, ten drafts. It just depends. Right. Wow. Now, at this point, is this where your team comes together? Do you have an editor? Uh, is there other people involved? I guess there's somebody that actually creates the electronic version, prepares it for print. Like, is there a team that you work with? Yeah, there's um, there's a guy I use for typesetting and, uh, like, proofreading. Okay. And then uh, as far as just beta readers, I tend to use my wife, my mother, uh, a few other family members, people who, you know, been reading my stuff for years and, you know, will, will generally give me somewhat honest feedback. Okay. <laughs> That's it. cool. Um, uh, but then, you know, and then I have a cover designer that um, someone I've also worked with for a while who I know I can give him some direction on what I had in mind and then he can just bring it to life. You know, it's pretty amazing to see the stuff that this guy can do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, no, pretty much from that point, like I said, since I'm now I'm working independently, I have control over that whole process where before it was send off the book to the publisher and they just 
eventually they will give you a cover and you really don't have any say over the cover and right. uh, the final you know content you know is pretty much out of your hands mm-hmm. um, which some writers like that you know some writers don't want to focus on the production aspects of things right I've never been like that I've always been a hands-on person mm-hmm. so, um, I you know I like to I have I like having input in every part of every step of the process so okay okay now, cool. now, at, at what point does this book end up on uh, Brandon uh, Massey dot com? And that's Brandon spelled the way it sounds. Uh, Massey M A S S E Y dot com. At what point does that book end up on Brandon Massey dot com? So normally, um, I like to once I know the book is going to be done and published by a certain date, mm-hmm. which I would say is typically about. Two months before I'm going to publish it, I will at that point post it on my website, post, you know, the cover, um, a synopsis, Mm -hmm. an excerpt, um, maybe some pre-order links to various, you know, channels for people to buy it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll I'll start promoting it. I have an email newsletter that folks can sign up with by visiting my website. So um, folks who are on that newsletter, I will also give them this advance notice about a forthcoming book. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, you know, it's interesting though, with, with the rise of the social media, a lot of the authors are finding that their own websites really aren't that valuable anymore. I mean, they're spending their time on Facebook. Wow. You know, <laughs> just letting people know via Facebook that they've got a new book out. So, mm-hmm. uh, I, I will, I do that too. Um, when a book's out, I'll post it on my website. I'll post it on Facebook. Um, I need to re- I need to revive my Twitter account, but I'll I'll put it on there too. Okay. Uh, you know, from from that point, you know, once you get that initial push, things sort of take off from there. And um, sometimes I'll do some you know additional um, advertising or mm-hmm. promotion to just keep things you know kind of going from that initial push. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, does that like, take that, that advertising and promotion? Is that uh, w- what form does that take? Is that ads on Facebook? Is that other things? What it's I would say ads on Facebook are a really, really effective way of, uh, of getting the word out because it's just so targeted um, to the to the exact profile of the people you're trying to reach. So that's that's one way. Um, mm-hmm. Amazon actually has. Uh, advertising channels that they've opened up to independent authors now. So that's something else that I've been exploring. Okay. Uh, but then there's some other websites like um, there's an email distribution uh, list called BookBub, uh, bookbub.com. Okay. And they have a really powerful email list where you basically um, purchase um an ad that goes out to a, a pre-selected group based on whatever genre you're writing in. And they have an African-American list as well. I think it has something like 100,000 people on it. I mean, it's it's just crazy. Wow. Is that you have to pay for that, I suppose? You do have to pay for that. But it's when you look at the actual cost of it compared to the benefits, mm-hmm. potential benefits, it's I mean, it's it's cheap. It's cheap. I mean, you're talking couple hundred bucks to reach a hundred thousand people that's nothing you know that's nothing. So, right yeah so but they, you know there there's this whole uh ecosphere so to speak that that's sprung up to support this whole movement toward independent work mm-hmm. so, you know you have like i was talking about your typesetters your graphic designers your freelance editors your book promotion vehicles you know all these things have created after the rise of ebooks and print on demand and, you know, all this, you know, audio books and authors can create on their own. All this stuff has sprung up to support that. So you just don't, you don't need a traditional publisher unless you just are, have your heart set on getting your book into Walmart. Right. You know? Right. Right. So you feel like we're in the entering the age of the decentralized uh, mode of production, so to speak. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. You know, okay. Yeah. Now, years ago, I remember driving uh, with some buddy of mine to New York to uh, listen to uh, George Frazier. He did a book called Success Runs in Our Race. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was George Frazier. And then I remember going to 
uh, another lecture. It was uh, uh, Ron Karinga, Maulana Karinga, I think he calls his name now. And then, uh, so I remember going to these, you know, book signings, different places and stuff. And I remember back in the day in Borders, I would see the sister circles, right? You know, the cutie pies with the locks and, and, and all that kind of stuff, sitting around, pull the chairs together. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? They all reading this thing like once a week. They meet up. Is that still happening now? It still happens. It's I would say it's not as prevalent as it was. Okay. Um, like back in the, you know, like 2003, 2004, you know, I was doing book club meetings like all the time. Okay. Um, so I would say that, you know, and I, I actually do have a book club meeting scheduled next month, but they're not – you don't see as much of them as they used to. Some of the book clubs, I'll be honest, some of them were just more <laughs> more like social gatherings of, you know, women just kind of want to get together, you know, talk, drink wine, eat. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, the book was sort of a sort of an afterthought. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, you know, that's, that's cool. I mean, but they were they were still supporting authors. They were buying the works. Um you know, some of them were really avid readers and really into, you know, digging deep into the, the book and asking, you know, incredibly detailed questions of the authors about why you why you did this or that with your story. Mm-hmm. And I think that's still there, but I don't see as much of it as I used to. OK, so I think I think what's what's probably happened is a, some of that discussion has migrated online, you know, so it's no longer. You know, sisters sitting together, you know, in the living room, you know, now they're talking on Facebook, you know, okay. so, uh, it's just, you know, it's, there's still conversation, but it's not it's not the, it's not in the same uh, same location as it used to be, I think. Gotcha. Gotcha. So for people who want to be notified about your upcoming book now, let's let's talk about it. We kind of talked off air. Uh, you said that there was a book you were working on, you know, coming out uh, this fall or or winter, maybe. Uh, can you talk about that? You said it was the working title is what you said, frenzied, right? Frenzied, and it really deals with. Um, I've always been fascinated by these these live work play communities where they have a lot of them here in Atlanta, where they sort of like these self contained cities. Hmm. Are you you know you drive through and they've got you know they've got the retail you know with the restaurants and the shops, and then they have the residential aspects. Of you know all the houses, apartments, condos, what have you, and then they have uh, a play element. So they may have you know a golf course, bowling alleys, you know things like that. So I was just thinking, uh, you know, whenever you're writing something like a, a thriller or a horror novel, it's all about trying to create an isolated location where you can have you know your bad stuff go down. Okay. So um, with this particular story, it takes place in a live, work, play community, a place that. You know, I, it's, it's fictional. I created it, mm-hmm. but um, there's basically a um, an infestation of an unknown um, virus, so to speak, okay. that begins to spread like wildfire through this community. Wow! It follows. So you know, you've got this community of you know, let's say two thousand people. Mm-hmm. Contained with liter- already contained within walls that they created themselves right. <laughs> as part of the community that they agreed to live in. Mm-hmm. So you know what happens when something like that, some type of threat, takes hold that causes people to behave in ways that are you know deeply disturbing. And uh, okay, I think I see where you're going. That's cool, yeah. man. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So that's that's frenzy, and that's coming out. Fall, early winter, is that the yeah, thing? Yeah, like let's say September. Um, okay, okay, we'll call it September. All yeah. right. Um, I want to talk about a couple more books, and then we're gonna kind of wrap it up. Maybe we could talk a little bit about like some advice for aspiring authors, things of that sort. Uh, Covenant. Can you tell us about Covenant? So Covenant was a book I did in. I actually wrote that in two thousand eight. Um. That story deals with, I've always been fascinated by religion okay. and specifically um, sort of the the charismatic type Christian churches where it was, the church is really based around the personality of a, you know, a charismatic leader. 
Sure. So there was quite a bit of that here in the Atlanta area. So, for example, like a uh, Bishop Eddie Long, who recently passed. Wow, yeah. Or uh, Creflo Dollar, you know, who uh, heads up <laughs> another large church. That's a $63 million plane, man. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh-huh. So, that, you know, that's that's a really, well, you know, it's popular. Um, these churches are very popular in the Atlanta area. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know I've been to some of them myself. I was a member of one of the churches for a while. So I have, you know, my own inside information perspective on some of the things that happen. Mm -hmm. And so I just really was wanting to write a story about, you know, what if there is such a church with large membership, thousands of members, very influential leader who, let's say their agenda just isn't necessarily Christian. Maybe what if their agenda is control? You know, what if it's power? Mm -hmm. Um, What does that look like? What happens in that situation? Mm -hmm. You know, how can you deal with some of the people who are so fanatical in their belief that they don't even question Mm -hmm. what the leader of that church is doing? Like any, they they can, they can do no wrong, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. they say is okay. And I think that that is a very dangerous attitude. You, you sure that's fiction? <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, goddamn, man. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> you describe it everything but the Kool Aid. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You wow. know, it, it's, that's what's scary about it is that it's it's all very realistic. So just uh-huh. taking that that's really the background of Covenant is you've got this um, very influential, powerful church, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and got some characters who are basically standing in the way of that church reaching its ultimate objective. And um, there's basically a, this secret scandal that involves the pastor of the church. Wow. And Okay. All right. You know, Did you get any was, backlash from that book? I mean, what were, were people, were their <laughs> religious sensitivities offended? I mean, you know, it's, it's funny. It's funny you ask that because I thought I would, but mm-hmm. I think honestly that the people who read my stuff in general, probably don't go to those churches I okay guess, okay because i didn't really get um the backlash that i was expecting to get i was just getting more of a oh yeah yeah that's how yeah that's how they are wow. <laughs> that's exactly okay just, talk about cornered so cornered was actually my last book with um kensington mm-hmm. and that one dealt with um dealt with a character who Basically, he had grown up in Detroit. He was best friends with this guy who, you know, I think we've all had these friends who probably were people we, on retrospect, shouldn't have been friends with. But for whatever reason, you know, you hung out with them and you did stuff with them that maybe you regret doing. But let's say at some point you put that past behind you. Maybe you maybe you move to a different city. You're no longer in contact with this person. So that's the main character of the book. His name is Corey. He's had he his running partner from back in the day in Detroit uh, was this guy who um, basically is beca- what became a career criminal. OK. And um, it got bad enough with his former best friend. His former best friend is actually on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Wow. He's on the run. Um, and then Corey, you know, is rebuilt his life. He's moved to Atlanta. He's married, you know, got a kid. Everything's gravy. But then his old friend just shows up one day and he's basically like, yo, what's up? <laughs> we, wow. should, you know, we should hang out again. <laughs> and, it's uh. like, and it just builds from there of, you know, trying to basically cut those ties, sever mm-hmm. those ties, um, you know, that you have with your past and yeah. how different that that can be sometimes mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, you still have some of those old loyalties of feeling like, you know, I, I don't want him to think that I've, you know, uh, you know, sold out or this or that, you know, I want him to know, think I'm still down with the cause. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, that, that's scary to cut loose people that are toxic. Yeah. Um, that you've grown, you've outgrown, so to speak. You yeah. Know? You know, it's, it's something that I, I personally have dealt with and it's, you know, it's a little, um, it's a little uncomfortable because you're just like, look, you know, we were we were close 30 years ago. We don't have 
anything in common anymore. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It's like, and to even try to open that door again is just going to cause problems. So you just, you know, you just kind of have to move on. But it's it's just not always easy to do that. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue to talk to Brandon Massey, uh, horror and suspense uh, novelist. Um, You know, years ago, uh, Brandon, I remember talking to this uh, dry media artist. He was in the mall with the kiosk and the stencil and, you know, and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was I was still in high school. Me and my buddy was asking him all kinds of questions. And he said something I never forgot. He said it takes 10 years to master a medium. And he was talking about pastels, pencils, oil, you know, I don't know if they have placa anymore, but things like that. Yeah. So you've been writing since what? You've been published since 2002, correct? Yeah, since 2002. Well, we're actually more like mid 90s. I did some shorter work, but okay. I was okay. writing. I've been writing since I was 15, like seriously, seriously writing. So almost 30 years. So you've definitely attained mastery uh, in, in the art of telling a story. Can you talk about some of the pain points that you've discovered along the way? Some common mistakes uh, the authors uh, may encounter, things of that nature. Yeah, I think one of the biggest mistakes is just not taking it seriously enough. Okay. Um, you know, what's really necessary, not just when you're learning, but even when you've been doing it a while, is just to be very consistent in just working, just writing. Like I literally try to write every single day. I don't let a day pass where I don't write something. Mm -hmm. Every day I write means that I'm growing. You know, I'm writing something, I'm learning more, I'm continuing to practice my craft. And what oftentimes when I talk to, to writers who will ask questions about, you know, how do you get started? How do you finish, finish a book? And I'll ask them, well, when's the last time you wrote something? Oh, you know, I haven't done anything in a while. I'm just kind of thinking about something. I'm like, that's, you're not serious about it. You know, you've mm-hmm. got to write. Just like if you imagine if you are a, um, you know, you call yourself a guitar player, a guitarist. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine not playing your guitar every day? I mean, why would you not play it every day? I mean, right. if that's what you do, that's part of who you are. If that's your passion, that's your expertise. That's something you're going to regularly practice. So I would say the number one thing that people fail to do mm-hmm. is just to write on a consistent basis. If you do that, everything just starts to take care of itself. Wow. Uh, it's really that simple. You know, writing, after that, I would say um, reading. You know, reading is sort of the pathway to writing. Okay. So, you know, reading, you know, everything you can get your hands on, you know, lots of different stuff. Um, you should always be reading something mm-hmm. if you are, you know, it, it may not be fiction. I mean, you just, just to be reading something, though, is, I think is a very important um, I think if you do those two things, you can be successful. You know, I, I think sometimes writers will get too worried about the business aspect of, you know, how do I promote something or, you know, do I need to get my book copyrighted or, you know, how am I going to promote myself? All that stuff is just, you don't even need to worry about that until you've written a lot of material. Because like you said, like you're, this guy you met said, it's 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or to do another analogy, 10,000 hours. Uh-huh. Okay. Right, right, right. It's a level of competence. Uh-huh. And just looking at my own, um, you know, uh, path, I, I really do think that that's pretty accurate. Okay. So you're looking at, if I'm a new writer starting today, if I'm writing, you know, five pages a day, I'm still looking at probably about five years mm-hmm. before I'm ready for prime time, so to speak. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, all right. Wow, Brandon, man, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, brother. Yeah, yeah, I've enjoyed this, definitely. Uh, So um, just uh, to wrap up, you're going to come out with a novel, uh, let's just say uh, September of 2017, and the working title is Frenzied. Yep. And in August, in August of 2017, you mentioned to me uh, Atlanta Noir. Can you speak to that real quick? Yeah, Atlanta Noir is a story of uh, crime and mystery stories anthology um, 
that's being released in August. And basically, it, all the writers participating have been asked to write a story that takes place in a respective neighborhood of Atlanta. So uh, I wrote about Grant Park, which I'm very familiar with. So I put my story there. And the story is called The Prisoner, and the book comes out in August. Righteousness, righteousness. Where do folks buy your books? Uh, Tell us how to reach out to you on social media. I would say uh, buying the books, the best place to start would be Amazon. They've got all of them in both ebook and paperback editions. Okay. And then as far as social media, go to my website, Mm brandonmassey.com. And then you can also find me on Facebook. At, at author Brandon Massey, right? Yep. At author Brandon Massey. Fantastic. Listen, yep. man, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for appearing on the show. Yeah, man, I've appreciated it. Thank you very much. Yo, family, that's another episode of Jonathan Soul in the Bag. Hope y'all dug it, and I hope y'all took note of the contact info at the end of that interview. Go ahead and reach out. Go ahead and support those folks. Hey, listen, by the way, family, speaking of support, you can support your friendly neighborhood podcaster by going over to jonathansoul.com and picking up my ebook, Malcolm Mars. Malcolm like the prophet, Mars like the planet. It's an ebook I wrote, three families go to Mars to escape the violence and racism of Earth. Black people in space always uh, intrigue me, and that's what you get. You get the politics, the aliens, the family dynamic, the high technology, the whole nine. And uh, I think they're vegetarian or something of that sort. But yeah, family, go ahead and check them out. Uh, also, uh, you can follow me on uh, social media, J O H N A T J N S A U L on Black Spot, on Tumblr, and on Twitter. And of course, you can subscribe to this show on iTunes. And uh, if you go to johnfistol.com, there's a little RSS feed that you can link up with. Listen, I love you guys. Hope all your dreams come true. And if they're not, just work a little bit smarter. 